Now, we've been saying all along that Ruby is object-oriented. Everything in Ruby is an object, but we haven't really defined that. For that, I need to explain the difference between an object and a class. I really need to use a few diagrams here, so excuse the use of a presentation. I promise not to do this very often. A class is a blueprint. Now, what do I mean by that? Think of a blueprint for a house. An architect draws it up, once it's done, you can turn out a whole neighborhood's worth of houses on the same design. We've seen strings before. String is a class. The individual strings you type into IRB are objects. Notice that each object, the rectangular boxes, point back at the class string. Each object remembers what class it's an instance of. Put another way, an object is an instance of a class. You'll hear the terms object and instance used more or less interchangeably. The object knows its class. The class provides the behaviors. We've learned how to write methods. The new fact about them here is that a method is attached to a class. Each object, in turn, has its own data. Taking string as an example again, strings have a method size that tells you how long the string is. They all share the definition of this method because it lives on the class string. But not all strings will respond with the same answer because they're not all the same size. The actual size is a property of the particular string, the object. The data in an object is stored in variables. You're already familiar with them. When they're defined inside a method, they're scoped to the method. They disappear when the method ends. Now we're talking about a new type of variable, an instance variable. It's scoped to the class. It can be accessed from any method in the class. In almost every respect, they behave just like the variables you've already seen. One difference is that the name of an instance variable is prefixed with an at sign. Another difference, a variable declared inside a method comes into existence, brand new, each time the method runs and disappears afterward. Instance variables are created when the object is created and they keep their value between method calls. They hang around for as long as the object does. There's another type of variable associated with classes called a class variable. As you can imagine, this is tied to the class, not the instance. You can tell them apart because they're prefixed with two at signs instead of one. Because they're tied to the class, there's just the one value, not one for every instance. Class variables aren't as common as instance variables. How do you create an instance? The usual way is to call a method on the class, new. Here's an example using the array class. This creates an empty array, exactly as if you'd use the square brackets with nothing in them. Or you can create a new string this way. Again, you get an empty string, just like typing a pair of double quotes with nothing in them. This is a standard way of creating instances. There are exceptions, but by and large, this is how you do it. Just as there are instance variables and class variables, there are instance methods and class methods. An instance method is called through a particular instance. You've seen this sort of call before. An instance method is able to access pretty much anything in the class, including reading and writing instance variables, reading and writing class variables, or calling other methods. They also have read access to a special value called self. This value keeps a reference to the particular object the method was called on. Pretty much all object-oriented languages have some mechanism for this. In Java, they use the word this instead of self. Class methods are less common than instance methods. You call them through the class. You don't need an instance. An example of a class where you can find some of these is math. Here we're calling the log10 method. Class methods are defined by prefixing the name with self and a dot, like this. Because you don't use an instance to call these methods, they can't access instance variables or call instance methods, and they can't refer to self. They can only operate on class variables and on whatever arguments are supplied to them when they're called. There's a special instance method we should talk about called a constructor. Different languages have different mechanisms for defining these. In Ruby, the constructor is an instance method called initialize. Whenever an instance of the class is created, initialize runs automatically. It's supposed to do whatever setup is needed. Usually it sets starting values for any instance variables. You can have parameters to initialize. If you do, 
then you also need to pass those parameters into new, like this. Here the 5 will be passed to initialize. In this case it creates an array that starts out with 5 nil elements in it. Let's try applying some of what we've learned. I've created a file plant.rb, which is going to hold our class plant. Classes traditionally start with a capital letter, which tells Ruby that they are constants. We don't expect the definition of it to change. And like most things in Ruby, once you start it, you have to end it with the word end. I'm giving it a constructor, initialize. It accepts two arguments, a name and a height, which will measure in inches. What do we do with them? We store them in instance variables. This is okay to write because Ruby knows the thing on the left is different from the thing on the right because of the at sign. We load that. Ruby now recognizes the existence of a class called plant, and we can call plant.new to create an instance of it. What IRB does at this point is calls the inspect method on our plant object, which allows you to see the values of the different fields that make up the object. And this is nice for debugging purposes, but for the purposes of this demonstration, I'm going to override inspect to return a more useful looking string. Inch tall name like that. Load it again. And now we get a much nicer looking string. Five inch tall rows. Let's create a new instance method. Grow inches. Make our plant taller. Now I can define this like so. Ruby evaluates the expression on the right, stores it in the field on the left, and that'll work just fine. But because this is such a common idiom, this increment, there's a increment operator which looks like this. So that's just a little shorter way to write it. It does exactly the same thing. Now I'm going to get a reference to this and store it in the variable rows so that I can then call rows.grow2 and now we have a 7 inch tall rows. Switching back here, I'd now like to demonstrate a class method and for this I've decided to call the class method tallest. Obviously we can only have one tallest plant so this makes sense for a class method and we define it using self.tallest. We're going to need to keep track of the tallest plant. We'll do that in a class variable, at at tallest. We should define that when the class is loaded, like this. So when the class is loaded, that variable will come into existence and be empty. Now how do we update this variable at the appropriate times? Well, there are two conditions which allow something to be the new tallest plant. One is that we've just created a plant. So that's one place where we have to check whether it's the new tallest. The other possibility is when the plant grows, it might be the new tallest plant. Now I have to define this method, check for tallest. I'm going to put in the keyword private here. All methods defined after the keyword private are only available from inside the class like this. They're not available to callers from outside the class. Now how are we going to define this? We need a new mechanism here. Just as we use the while keyword to repeat something for as long as a condition remained true, here we want to use if, which allows us to check if something is true just once. So we start with if. Now there are two possible ways that it could be the new tallest plant. One is if we don't have a tallest plant. In other words, if this is the first plant we've ever created, 
then tallest will be nil. The other way, and here I'm going to use two vertical bars, which in Ruby means or. Our height, the, plant, the height of this plant, could be greater than the height of the current tallest plant. If either of those things is true, then the new tallest plant is this one, self. Now I've written this, but I haven't defined it. This method, I could define it like this. And that would do the job. But this is a very common idiom too. So again, Ruby has a shortcut attribute reader colon height. Colon height is a symbol, another data type in Ruby, and we'll see more of those in the future. This one line does the same thing as these three lines would do. Make sure we're kosher. I'm going to exit out, clear the screen, start over. Now I can immediately call plant.tallest without any plant instances existing. And of course I get nil. We don't have any tallest yet. But as soon as we create a five inch tall rose, that's now the tallest plant. If I create a six inch tall tulip, that's now the tallest. And of course, if it grows, we're just getting a reference back to the same tulip, which is now seven inches tall. The rose is now six inches tall, but the tallest is still the tulip. But if the rose grows another two inches, the tallest is now the rose. Classes have another useful property known as inheritance. This is a way of relating classes to each other in a hierarchy. Let's say we want to classify the Intrepid. The Intrepid is an instance of an aircraft carrier. More generally, it's a ship. But describing it as an aircraft carrier distinguishes it from other types of ships, such as steamships. A ship is a device for transportation across water, so more generally still, you could call it a vehicle. This links it to other types of vehicles, such as cars. And if you were talking about a specific car, you might further describe it as a Civic. You could carry on in this fashion to categorize everything that exists. Now let's go back to programming. When one class is a more general form of another, we call it a superclass, or a parent class. This time we'll take string as an example. We know that everything in Ruby is an object. This is expressed by the fact that class string has a superclass, object. Object doesn't have a superclass. It's like Adam, the great granddaddy of the class family. All other classes can trace their inheritance back to object. As another example, a number, like 1138, is a member of class fixnum. This is a subclass of integer, which is a subclass of numeric, which is also the parent class of non-integer types, like float. Numeric's parent class is object. So when we say that everything in Ruby is an object, we're also saying that every object is a member of a class, and every class ultimately inherits from the class object. So what exactly gets inherited? What do subclasses get from their parents? The answer is methods. If you define a method on the parent class, it magically becomes available to all the child classes. That means every instance of any of those classes will have the method on it. This is a great time saver. If you know you're defining a class vehicle, you can have a single method, like navigate two coordinates, and have it appear on all the subclasses, like civic and aircraft carrier. Now obviously, a civic and an aircraft carrier don't operate the same way. If you direct a civic to navigate to New Jersey, that order can't be performed in the same way an aircraft carrier would do it. So there's another mechanism, which is method overriding. This allows you to define a method on the child class with the same name as the method on the parent. The child's definition will override the definition on the parent. That way, you can inherit the parts of the parent class defini definition that still make sense in the child and replace the other parts using overriding.
Okay, check this out. Every object in Ruby has a class method, which returns the class. If you then call superclass on it, you get its superclass, you get its superclass. As we saw, the hierarchy leads up to object. Object has no superclass. String has a superclass of object, which again has a superclass of nil. Everything descends from object. Now, Ruby is a dynamic language. That means you can actually open up the class object and add things to it. It's going to be very really useful. There's a simple method. You can now access this from anywhere. Works on numbers. Works on strings. Works on these new symbols I just mentioned earlier. Works on anything because everything is an object. This is great, but you have to be really careful. This technique is known as monkey patching. When you open up a class and change the definition of something, not only can you add new methods, but you can actually replace methods that already exist. This is not the same as overriding. The old definition in that class is completely replaced by the one you put in here. Size on string is supposed to return a number. You can change it to return a string. Ouch! You can really, really confuse the system if you change the type of a return value to something that Ruby didn't expect. It's expecting a number. It's expecting that number to make sense. So you have to be really careful with this ability.